Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, Linda, let's let's talk a little bit about your experience. How long have you been going to the to these jails and working with? You said Alert is a small Mm -hmm. organization, grassroots organization. Let's talk a little bit about them first. Okay. uh, how long has it been in, around? Do you know? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, no, I'm really. I've okay. been volunteering for about three years. You've been volunteering for so about three years. I'm so, thinking, how did you get started? Um, when I heard that uh, underage girls were being trafficked, then um, Christina McKenzie, who is the founder of Alert, mm-hmm. she used to go into brothels and talk to women, and then she heard that. Mm-hmm. It was underage girls primarily that were being trafficked, That, um, and there were no safe homes, and they wound up arrested. So she began alert, and she came and spoke at DTS um, on human trafficking during a missions conference. And I listened to her message, and I thought, that makes perfect sense if we can prevent them from getting into it. Mm-hmm. So um, I first volunteered to make uh, art things that the girls can't have scissors or anything they mm-hmm. could use as a weapon. So I said, how about if I do some art projects for you that you can go in and do with the girls? And then there was a training coming up. You have to get um, a background check and everything to be able to go into detention. Mm-hmm. And they didn't offer those very often, but they were offering one. So I took that because I wanted to go in and meet the girls and work with them. And mm-hmm. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I didn't. I thought, you know, I'm so much older. I don't know if I could relate to them, but I told the Lord, you know, if you can love me through them, I'll do this. Mm-hmm. I, and it's been amazing. I mean, these I expected hardened girls that it would be really hard to break into their worlds, but they are just fun and smart and warm and affectionate. I mean, they're just so glad to see us and just thank us all the time for coming. And it's been a real surprise at how easy this has been. So um, so it's doable. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> it's so doable. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, if even – there's really a need for – to go in and minister to the boys because so much of this is changing the, the attitude of the buyers mm-hmm. and a lot of the young men in fact there were uh, they've asked us please can you get someone to come in and work with the boys there were over 50 boys that were asking for mentors there were only two male volunteers to mm-hmm. step up and so here are boys that want to be mentored who want to know what what does it look like to be the kind of man that I should be and there's no men that tell them that you know Mm. so their examples are pimps and um gang you know gang leaders and they there's just no one and they get the impression that nobody cares you know so that's um yeah Yeah, how does alert operate i mean obviously it's a grassroots volunteer Mm -hmm. organization but are they also a a non-profit Mm -hmm. and they're also 501c3 and and get support from churches like uh or or from individuals or from foundations in the city like uh like new friends and new life. Um, yeah, yes, <laughs> and um, and then we are. Um, one of the other things we do is provide Thanksgiving uh, meal to all of the kids in juvenile detention, the boys and the girls and the and the volunteers. So mm-hmm. we'll do that um, every year, and that's just a way to communicate to all the kids that they all matter, even the ones that we don't directly interact with. So Christina McKenzie will send out just a newsletter and just kind of um, people underwrite that for us so we we serve them thanksgiving which is fun we get to know all the kids and see them and and so so you so take people through what you what you do so you 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 obviously have a week is it a weekly meeting it's weekly uh uh-huh and and what exactly does that involve and then what's your if there is such a thing your typical experience with with a girl what that what's that going to be like we um, we come and we start out doing highs and lows. Like, what's your high of the week? What's your low of the week? And from that, we we just get to know the girls better, and um, they share. We encourage them. Um, it's amazing. They're kind of self. If they'll do something wrong, they'll like they they have a point system, so mm-hmm. um, they can lose points. That's how they do. And they'll be like, "Well, I lost points, but." But I know what I did wrong, and I know I was wrong, and I know I'm going to do better. So, um, but they're excited to share with us, you know, what their week went went like. So we'll do that, and then we'll. Um, I, there's so many great resources online. So I'll have maybe things I've 
I've I've bought like a lot of um, I am Second Stories, the mm-hmm. videos, or um, there's just a lot of good resources. So we'll pick kind of a topic, and we try to listen to what the girls. We've asked them, what do you want us to talk about? What would help you most? So if we see a need, or if they express a need, then we'll we'll address that. We'll we'll do it a lot of different ways. We'll do it through maybe some watching f- some videos. We'll have interactive things. We'll talk to them. Um, we try to make it fun and interesting and kind of vary it. And then lots of times we'll do a craft, but we'll try to tie the craft into what we do. So then they'll kind of remember it. But we also just want to give them an opportunity to make something that's beautiful that they, they, they see that they can. And in that, um, we're always looking for what are their strengths? What can we encourage them in? How did God gift them? And then if we hear of things like a girl's maybe share that, she was abused or something we make sure that someone's aware of that we Mm. make sure that she's getting the help that she needs and then we also um, the girls have a lot of time to read in there so we'll get really good christian books on um, um, say recovering from sexual abuse that would appeal to their age range Mm -hmm. and um, we're like you know if there are books that you want us to get you know that that would help you we can get resources for you. We want to make sure that you get the help that you need. And there, um, I know we had one case where um, a girl had disclosed that, and we talked to her about it. And there's a really good book called um, Breathe and um, Hush, which are a, a young woman who was molested by her stepfather. And um, I said, I'll get those books. I'll bring them next week. And I mean, she had read both those books by the next week and just said, thank you so much. You remembered. And I've read them both. And there was just a calmness in her mm-hmm. mind after that. I mean, her. So we're able to help them wherever we see a need. Now, the difficulty here is is that you, you have access to them while they're mm-hmm. in recovery, and that's about a three-month period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the hard part, I take mm-hmm. it, is is that they are released after those three months and have to go back out into the street. And so the next natural question is, so where do they go? Well, I mean, since they're minors, they go – the um, system makes sure that they have what they uh, – as safe of an environment as they have. So they usually go back home mm-hmm. um, if they don't have – safe home to go back to, then they'll put them in foster care. There are kids that have to stay in there longer because they don't have a safe place to go until they can find somewhere for them to go. Um, and a lots of times they wind up back in detention. Um, they'll go use drugs again or they'll get arrested again. And, and sometimes um, we get them, they've been in there once or twice, but it's amazing because Sometimes it takes that long for them to get it. And a lot of girls are like, you know, if I weren't in here, I'd be dead. When they finally get it, they're Mm -hmm. like, I know that they see it as being rescued because they – they're living pretty unsafe lives. If they're living on the streets, you know, if they're involved in the things that they're involved mm-hmm. in, um, m- most of these kids know someone who's been killed, either died from a drug overdose or been, you know, mm-hmm. um, shot in maybe gang violence or something. Mm-hmm. So they live pretty dangerous lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's the, the that's the hard part of, in some ways is that they go back and mm-hmm. and there's no. There's no good self safe place necessarily a good safe place to land. I mean, they've tried, but there's no guarantee that there's going to be a good landing once they're released. Or they they go back into the same environment that they weren't able to succeed in. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, um, for some kids, it was their own family members that were pressuring them into doing the things that they were doing. And we we're like, you know, we can get you into a, a safer place, you know, and mm-hmm. and we. Um, but they have to, um, you know, they have to. We can't contact them once they're out, but we, you know, we're like, please contact us, please. You know, they have to take the initiative. They do, yeah. um, just because they're minors. Mm-hmm. And like with kids, um, like one girl was going to go back uh, to her boyfriend because her clothes are there. We're like, we'll take you shopping. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't need to because she knew he wasn't good for her. Yeah. And, um, so we try to give them every, you know, reason to contact us. But lots of times they're back; they get caught back up in, and we often don't hear from them. We rarely hear from them, actually, which is really once heartbreaking. Once they get, mm-hmm. once they get out, yeah, mm-hmm. it's hard. That is hard. So, so, how do you break the cycle? Yeah. 
That's the question. The breaking the cycle is letting them see that there is a way out. Mm -hmm. It's it's giving them hope, letting them know that there is survival outside of this. And sometimes, as you mentioned, their their living environment is so detrimental or it's unsafe that for an adult woman, our best strategy is to get her out of this city, mm -hmm. to get her. We have connections with some in Kentucky and Tennessee and California. Get her out of – Let her get a fr complete fresh start. Fresh start to yeah. where it's safe, where the trafficker is not pursuing her mm -hmm. and, and because – as you mentioned, it, it is his income source. Mm -hmm. And unlike drugs, it's not disposable. He can sell it time and time and mm -hmm. time again. Mm -hmm. And so it's just ever growing. So there are times when the best solution is to get out of the city. But is there danger for these girls if they try and come to you for help? There is. There is danger. And so it's very important to us that we work with, with law enforcement, where we're working with court systems, mm -hmm. where we're working with Homeland Security and the FBI, mm -hmm. and working with those that are there to, to let them know you will be supported. And yeah, we actually have plans. And it's a follow-up. I don't normally do this, but we actually do have planned as a follow-up. I have a contact in New York who worked with the FBI and who works in this area and who works it from the law enforcement side. Right. And we're going to talk about the law enforcement dimension that's a part of this that's important because obviously there are several layers to this conversation. It is. You know, we're hosting a, a, a breakout in the conference against crime against women coming up in march and it's only for law enforcement and what the law enforcement has told us is finally we we needed something to break that cycle because mm -hmm. we kept arresting her taking her to prison yeah she they know get, who these people are go back out yeah, arrest her exactly, go back to her, and yeah. it's a revolving door that mm -hmm. just keeps going and so if we can offer a alternative to that revolving door and she can get out of that then i don't have to keep you know that cycle but that's really what it takes it takes uh, all of us in mm -hmm. the community coming around her surrounding her with the resources um, you mentioned that the girls in the safe houses many times will run or mm -hmm. in the foster care will <clears throat> run and that's what we mm -hmm. we have found also and so it makes you say what are they running from there mm -hmm. is it is there love there is mm -hmm. there support there is there respect there because if she's getting that love mm -hmm. and surrounded by that then she won't run mm -hmm. and so that's the key component to breaking that cycle but that's that's the key question we have to answer now um how how difficult is it to break another cycle that seems to me besides the dependence and the abuse and the eventability to trust, we're adding up all kinds of mm -hmm. layers here. Uh, how, how difficult is it to get people, these girls, to realize that this isn't the only way to earn money in order to survive? Because mm -hmm. really part of this is in some ways they're trying to survive and if they have children, in some cases they're thinking, well, this is the only way, it only means I have to provide for my child. Right. How do you break that cycle? So our goal is is to help her build a bridge to self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. That's really what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So we will help and we will help provide the food and rent assistance and transportation while she's getting education and job training and the things she needs to survive. Wrapped in all of that is helping her with her mental health. Because mm -hmm. as we've mentioned, especially if she started as a 13-year-old girl, she has got to go through a great amount of sexual abuse recovery and mental health resources that surround her to help her while we're walking this, building this path to self-sufficiency. But it's very, the job skills, the education, mm -hmm. the long-term sustainability is a critical component. Because if she does not believe she can provide for those two children at her kitchen table, mm -hmm. she will continue that cycle. And so we have to let her know that we've got her back. That mm -hmm. we're, if she works the program and if she will, you know, really follow through, then we're going to follow through too. And that um, there is a bridge, and the other end of that bridge is being self-sufficient and providing for her children in a long, long-term way. Now we've alluded to the fact that if you're a minor, you can't take the initiative to contact them. Does that change once they come of age? It does change when it comes of age, for sure. We definitely can contact them. But another key for the minors is working with their families. Mm -hmm. And New Friends New Life is starting an initiative in our juvenile detention program where now we're helping train and offer recovery for the families, too. Hmm. Because many times it's she was in a bad living environment, not because 
it was intentional, but because they were in the same cycle of abuse mm-hmm. and trauma and poverty that that she is in. Mm-hmm. And so if we can work with the families as well to provide some healing and some resources and some um, real tools for them, then she can go back to to a safe place again full of love and support but it's a it comes through really working both with the young girl and with their families because when she's a minor they really unless they relinquish the rights they have the control to decide if she can go to a safe house if she can go Hmm. get the resources she needs when she leaves the Mm -hmm. facility wow well, let, let's let's turn our attention in a slightly different direction because we've kind of painted the situation and the in what the practicalities of, of what is is faced in, in human trafficking. So someone says, like Linda, when she was hearing this radio broadcast years ago, um, well, this sounds fascinating. I think I might <laughs> maybe be interested in doing something to help. What what would what would that look like? What could someone do? Well, for New Friends New Life, they can help in a couple of ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, For sure, as men uh, and those that may have bought commercial sex in the past to make a decision today, they're not going to do that again. If they need to go get their recovery, if they need to go get the resources they need, it really starts there. If we could have men stop buying commercial sex, then we would stop having girls being abused from commercial sex. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing, that if men are engaged in commercial sex acts and that you know, as we talked about, could be online or in brothels or in clubs. It goes really stretches the gamut. If you can make that decision and get the help you need to stop buying that commercial sex, that's step one. Mm-hmm. Uh, then step two is decide how you can engage. What you know, our goal is always to say, what's your passion and your gifts? It never ceases to amaze me that we'll have a teacher come in mm-hmm. to, and want to volunteer, and we'll say, great, we'll put you in our children's program, and she'll say, oh. I can't take another minute with children. I spend all day, every day. Please, can I work with women? Yes. Okay, Mm -hmm. you can be a budget counselor. You can be a career works volunteer. You can help come and serve meals on Wednesday nights when we have our Bible studies. You can help. There are so many things that women and men can do to volunteer their time and their efforts and their energy and the talents. We just want to help decide what that is for you. What's that spark that God put on your heart? And then let's find the right fit for that so if they come to you you're gonna you're gonna open the opportunity for them to be of help somewhere and help give them a sense of where they might fit etc exactly question one is what's your gifts and talents Mm -hmm. what what's your passion and then let's i can promise you we we have a need that will match those those two things and uh in your situation with alert how does it work um just if anyone contacted alert and mm-hmm. and wanted to volunteer they could we wouldn't send someone in we would take someone who's been going in and always have Pair someone them up. right yeah. right um but also we would really love to have more male involvement mm-hmm. um just to do something with the boys and even if they went in and showed good films you mm-hmm. know even to if they're maybe intimidated they wouldn't know what to say maybe um there are so many good films that teach good values, and mm-hmm. the media s- affects things so much. A lot mm-hmm. of times, people are getting the, the negative Im- impacts mm-hmm. from movies, but to go in with some positive movies, and then maybe once a month out of that, have a discussion about the movies and the values, mm-hmm. that would be an easy way for someone who didn't feel comfortable, you know, maybe actually presenting a program that could really offer something. And the other thing that's interesting is kids have a lot of time and detention to read. Mm-hmm. And I'm surprised because, you know, here this is such a great environment. You've got kids that don't have their cell phones. They don't have their computers. They don't have the friends to run around <laughs> yeah, with. They yeah, get yeah. them in trouble. And you're like the best thing to show up all week, you know, <laughs> yeah. besides the time. They value their families, too. Mm-hmm. And so um, just, you know, if you can encourage them to do things and provide things for them to where now you have a captive audience and things that didn't appeal to them otherwise appeal to them a lot and you have time and opportunities to change their minds and their thoughts about things and attitudes, that would be great with both the boys and the girls. 
So how does someone contact New Friends New Life? They can call. At, probably the easiest way is to Google okay. <laughs> New Friends New Life okay. or just go to our website, newfriendsnewlife.org. It okay. is .org, okay. and it's all spelled out. And on that website gives lots of different ways on how to serve, how to give, how to raise awareness in my community on the issue so that my neighbors understand what the issue is. So there's lots of resources there. Or they can call. We have a weekly Bible study that we do every single single Wednesday evening, so we can connect them to that if they want to come and serve meals or work as mentors, uh, budget counselors. The best contact, though, is through our website, newfriendsnewlife.org. Okay. And for alert? It's alertdfw.org. Uh-huh. Okay. And same thing, there would be contact info on there. Now, does that mean that alert has different city chapters around the country? or or? No, I think probably just the name alert. Just <laughs> alert. was probably okay. taken already. Okay. So. okay. Um, now, here, here's here's a question that I have um, because, you know, we send this out to churches and, and ministers and that kind of thing. So uh, let, me, let me ask two questions. First is, um, if you could say anything to pastors of churches about human trafficking and um, a developing sensitivity in your church for human trafficking, what would you say? Let's start there, and then I'll have a second question I'll ask later. Well, one, I would say please know that this is very biblical, mm-hmm. uh, this concept of justice, mm-hmm. this concept of the woman at the well, mm-hmm. this concept of the Good Samaritan. There are stories just – so many stories in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that refer that could be taught from the front uh, about human trafficking. And I've heard pastors say, "Oh, I can't, I can't talk about that." You know, we we can talk about that in our women's ministry, mm-hmm. but we're not going to talk about it from the front. Mm-hmm. And we we just want you to say the way to end, just like abolitionists did, mm-hmm. you know, in the Civil War, the way to end this kind of modern day slavery is to talk about it, shine the light, God's light on it. Hmm. Get in the Word and find out what it says about that and how Jesus responded to that. And that's the best news I, I know is to tell pastors that it's okay. There are resources out there available to where we can talk about it in our churches and to know that, that very likely there are for sure guaranteed abused women in your congregation Mm -hmm. and possibly traffic girls in your congregation. Mm -hmm. And so the sensitivity that comes to that is very important. And so uh, we offer resources on how to talk um, to these young girls, talk to abused survivors, so that there's sensitivity that, that goes around that. And then third, just to know that that there are um, you know, resources out there that can be met. The one thing that we do ask our church partners is please don't just put another Band-Aid on that wound. Mm-hmm. If she comes to you and says, well, I just need my rent paid, I just want my you know, groceries, mm-hmm. there is true transformation. Mm-hmm. There is a full-fledged program to get her a new life. Mm-hmm. And so we say instead of putting a Band-Aid on and mm-hmm. saying, okay, here's your rent, Go down the road. Yeah, so you want more than just someone writing a check. Exactly. Let, yeah. Let's connect her to New Friends, New Life. Let's connect her with resources so she can get true help that she needs, mental health resources, job training, education, mm-hmm. all of that wrapped around experts in the field that have been working on this for 16 years. Mm-hmm. And so instead of just a quick fix, connect with those mm-hmm. that really um, are committed to the issue. Now, what would, what would Linda, what would you say to pastors of churches if you could say something? I would want to say that uh, several things is one is the attitude that seems to have prevailed through history toward prostitutes is mm-hmm. um, if a woman, especially a girl who's taken into prostitution, they are abused quite severely so they don't cross the line, so they don't uh, run or, you know, try to get away from their pimp. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're raped, they're beaten if they don't meet a certain quota lots of times mm-hmm. there there's severe consequences and these aren't women lots of times that are there's just a preconceived notion that these are just women or girls that um like sex or that want this way to make money or, or but there really is so much abuse in there and this, this is more than a women's rights issue it's mm-hmm. a human's human right issue mm-hmm. and then also just there's a link a uh, quite a link between pornography and and trafficking that that is um, creating a lot more of a demand for sex mm-hmm. and if if there are like 300,000 say trafficked women in the US those women have um like 
for anywhere from five to 30 men a night that they um, have as customers, that's an awful lot of men that are driving this. And, and it is, um, if there weren't a demand, there wouldn't be a supply. And mm-hmm. so I think to change attitudes toward this, mm-hmm. both on viewing the women with compassion and then um, holding the men accountable for what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So Very I think well those said. would be that's two great. points. Yeah. Great. Now, the second question that I have goes like this. You know, the, we tend to think of individuals volunteering. But uh, again, because this is going out to churches, uh, and, and the podcasts are sometimes designed to, to speak to small groups or Bible studies of groups of people who are meeting together, um, do you all get uh, many volunteers that actually are a group of – I mean, you mentioned the Bible study that's kind of the gist of what led to New Friends, New Life. Um, uh, if you had a chance to say something to a small group or a Bible study that, that might be diving into this for the first time and it's brand new or whatever, uh, what might you say to them about what their opportunities might be? Because a lot of small groups meet together and they sometimes get asked the question, uh, well, what, what could we as a group do in ministry together? That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, what what? Well, there are many opportunities. Here locally, they can connect with agencies like New Friends New Life or like Alert. We have two groups, usually they're Bible study groups, every week bring food to serve. Mm-hmm. Or they can pray You know, within their small group to really research and, and make themselves aware about what the Bible says, but what our culture says about sex and about what this does to the women, and they can pray for the work and pray for healing. They can write cards, support cards, you know, I'm here mm. for you, I'm praying for you. Maybe put it in a Bible and a great book that they read and give those um, so that we can pass those out to the women and children really any way that they can just kind of get engaged and know that there's something that can be done in their community. They can show films. There's lots of films out now that small groups are doing to raise awareness where they watch the film and discuss that or they read a book and they'll discuss what that means. I'm going to talk about resources in just a second. And it's a critical piece to that because I know especially within our churches, Mm -hmm. the women that come to us, you know, are are particularly cautious about coming into a church. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their abuse happened in the church. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were told they needed to endure the abuse that happened in the church. Mm -hmm. Um, They are told that God is their father, and their father was their abuser. Mm -hmm. They were told that they're a sinner, that they're dirty, that they're condemned, that they're going to hell. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of those misconceptions and myths and lies that these girls have been told since such early ages that we as small groups or as larger groups Mm -hmm. can come back and say, we're going to break that myth. Mm -hmm. We're not going to listen to that anymore. Those are lies that Mm -hmm. are being told to you. You are good. You are worthy. You are valued. And there is redemption there. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Linda? Um, One thing that Alert does is we provide any girl um, who wants a Bible, Mm -hmm. um, a Bible. They Because we're working within the juvenile justice system, we have restrictions put on us. And one is they can't have hardback books, so we have to provide things in paperback. Um, Volunteers can't come in and help unless they've gone and gotten a badge. So they have to go through the training system that the juvenile justice system has in order to – like we can't just have people come in and speak. Mm -hmm. But but if a group wanted to do it, I think to – like a film night would be great because Mm -hmm. the thing is is they wouldn't all have to come each week if there was Mm -hmm. a large group they could kind of divide up so it wouldn't be so overwhelming if they felt like well i can't give one night a week but i could give one night every second or third week um and then um so and the other thing we send out prayer requests each week we take prayer requests from the girls and we send those out each week so if anyone wanted to get on our list and just pray for our girls that would be great um so um that those are all things. Also, a lot of the girls want mentors when we get out, mm-hmm. and when they get out. So if someone wanted to be a mentor. And the other thing that's kind of been disappointing is a lot of the church groups go in and don't um, – they don't really preach a message of grace to these girls. They mm-hmm. come in very – girls will say, this other group said this, and it's something that isn't biblical at all. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of scary because their concept of what God is, they're hearing a lot of different perspectives from different groups. And so when that happens, you know, we're always sharing 
the Bible, we always mm-hmm. say, well, if they say that, we'll go, well, let's go see what the Bible says about that. Because that a lot of people can say a lot of things about God, and we need to see what the Bible says. So we always try to turn them to the Bible, and then we'll give them verse cards that have a really pretty picture in Scripture that I make and have printed like at photo places, mm-hmm. and um, just – you know, um, if churches wanted to even help alert to say, get scripture in their hands, mm-hmm. you know, because they save those and we teach those. I mean, we, we get them to um, just to hold on to them. They like those a lot. So, uh. well, let's talk about resources briefly. Um, okay. Because uh, Linda, I see that you brought a couple of things mm-hmm. that you want to uh, show that you think are helpful, get people oriented. So, why don't you share what you what you brought? Okay. This is um, a video called Nefarious, and mm-hmm. it's a documentary on the um, global sex trafficking um, problem. But it won a lot of awards, and it also has some really good um, interviews. Um, ones with Annie Lobert, who's a former prostitute who has a ministry called Hookers for Jesus, I think, in Las Vegas. Mm. And there's just former uh, Johns, who are men who buy sex, um, former. Uh, former trafficker, um, and a lot of people that are helping women get out. So this is a great, great um, DVD if anyone wants to learn more about it. And then this is a book um, by Victor Malarek, who went um, interviewed a lot of men who buy sex, just to kind of get a profile of the men that buy sex and what drives that. I thought that was a really so it's I, called just the it's title. called the Johns uh-huh. Sex for Sale and the Men Who Buy It. Okay, and um, Victor Malarek. That's M A L A R E K, and he's a Canadian journalist. Mm-hmm. And then um, the Polaris Project mm-hmm. is um, they run the human trafficking hotline, and that number is eight 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 thirty seven thirty seven eight eight eight, and that's a great resource if people have questions if they see something that looks like trafficking. Um, any any underage girl or boy who is selling their body um, is a trafficking victim by definition because that minors cannot consent to sex. So if anyone is a minor who is selling their body, they are actually a victim of human trafficking. So um, that's a good number if anyone has questions or if they want to give to someone who wants to um, who is trapped and needs out or just to learn more. And they have great resources on their website. Um, so it's uh, it's called thepolarisproject.org. Okay. So. Any, anything else? And also for church leaders, New Friends New Life is, is hosting a breakout session for Greater Dallas Movement Day that is January 23rd at mm-hmm. the Dallas Convention Center. And so Tim Keller's coming and others, and they're, they're estimating 1,600 faith leaders are coming together to talk about ways to end major issues in our city like poverty and human trafficking. Mm-hmm. And so that's a great time to come. And we ask that if people are interested in, in knowing about the faith community, in particular with human trafficking, that's a great afternoon session. It'll be a three-hour session as well. Now, the one thing I don't know is whether or not we will release before or after that event, but in okay. one way or the other, we'll, uh, we'll alert people to either um, that it's coming or that uh, – or that on the other end of it, what's come out of it, because uh, right. because that is a significant event that is happening in the city. Well, I really do thank you all for taking the time to come in and talk to us about this. It's like, like it's uh, the, there are two topics that I feel really uh, are important that we've tried to talk to churches about. One is one is this one, human trafficking. Mm-hmm. The other is domestic abuse, which is kind mm-hmm. of the other side of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're planning on dealing with several – have several podcasts to deal with various aspects of this problem. But the one that we've just – that we're doing, this one, is important because it is really it represents an invitation to people to take advantage of the opportunity to minister in a way. You know, some people say, well, what can I possibly do or what mm-hmm. what might uh, what might be of value? So I thought we, in closing, I thought what I'd let you all do is I'm going to ask you all, do you have one story of kind of hope or encouragement uh, that we could end with? Because this this, in some ways this is a grim topic. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a – it. We're very much looking at the at the underside of how people treat treat one another. Um, so, uh, do you have uh, some story of hope or encouragement that you could 
you could offer to people. There's so many stories of hope. That's the best part of what yeah. I do. Yeah. You know, we say this is such a roller coaster and there are mm-hmm. such lows, but then there are high highs where Jesus comes in and just saves the day. The one that I'm thinking about is a wonderful woman that's in our program. She has two precious girls, one that's 16 and one that's nine years old. And she endured the same cycle of abuse that we've talked about this afternoon. And she ended up in prison. And her two children were staying, bounced around, staying with grandparents and others. And when she got out, she got in contact with a survivor from New Friends New Life. And she said, the second I leave this prison, I'm going to that office. And they're, I'm going to make sure they talk to me the day I get out of prison. And she did. And that was three years ago. She now has a fantastic job. Her daughter is in a private school and is excelling. She's probably going to be president in the United States someday. I would not be surprised. She has a new home through Habitat for Humanity. Her daughter is is signing up and enrolling for college. I mean, it's a true story of transformation and breaking that, what we've talked about, that generational cycle mm-hmm. of abuse. But it be, came because she was courageous. And she said, I believe that I can. And then he said, I know you can mm-hmm. through me. And so she accepted the love of Christ and accepted that not only for herself, but for her changed family. And it didn't just change her and her children. It mm-hmm. changed her whole community now. Mm-hmm. It changed her her family. It changed her neighbors. It changed everyone around her. And that's what a transformed life can do. That's great. Linda? Yeah. Um, well, I had said that some of the girls come in more than one time, mm-hmm. and we had one girl that we just loved. She was just fun. All the girls loved her, too. And um, she she said, can I share something? And we said, sure. And she said, when I was – someone told me that when I was in before, I was just a strung-out um, druggie that they had no hope for. And she said, but – she said, that's not me anymore. And she said, and, and I love God so much. I love Jesus. And um, I'm so glad I'm not that person I was before. So we hear stories like that all the time where um, God just works in their heart and, and brings them, you know, brings them out of what they're in and sets them aside. Kind of only about 5% of people who need help for drug abuse get it. And mm. so just the fact that they're there, you know. Um, and we're able to share truth with them. So we hear stories like that all the time from girls. Well, so there's hope. Lots it's of hope. doable. It's doable. <laughs> there's lots of and there's hope. <laughs> well, great. I want to thank both of you for coming in and taking the time to do this. As I said, it's something that's uh, very important to to us. We think there's a terrific value in showing how service and ministry uh, really does touch uh, all parts of life, and this is certainly a part of life. And our hope is is that people who have listened have gotten a glimpse of of what's possible, uh, of ministry that is possible, of what churches can do that's possible in a way that, that makes a difference, a uh, profound difference in individual lives. So thank you all very much, and we thank you for being a part of the table where we discuss issues of God and culture, and we trust that this uh, look at human trafficking has been an encouragement and instructive. For listening to the table podcast dallas theological seminary teach truth love well